actually, that gives me a little bit of hope for mainland China, too. The, I'm sure the idea was that after the CCP had controlled Tibet for so many decades and had pushed the propaganda that the Dalai Lama was this uh, oppressive, theocratic, feudal thing, they, as you said, they were expecting people to have been so brainwashed, they would have like hated the Dalai Lama as soon as they saw him. After all the propaganda. It didn't yeah. work. So I wonder if in the rest of mainland China, despite the, all of the decades of the CCP pushing you know, this communist, atheist, you know, destroy Chinese history and culture, uh, as soon as the CCP is gone, it'll be like, no, that was never us. I, I, I can completely imagine, you know, really uh, things falling apart from the center and for the Chinese people to finally like truly express themselves. Because right now they are completely under this fear where they are not able to express themselves in any manner. They can't right now, you know. So I can't imagine how after China is actually free from CCP, how the people will come out. Because we saw a spurt of that in Tiananmen, you know. And we haven't seen anything like that after it. Because, you know, CCP had learned how to control that through its mil uh, military power. So they, they have, that's why being so careful, spending all the money way more internally within its territory than outside, right? So this is exactly why. Uh, it was not just in the occupied territories of Tibet or uh, Uyghur, you know, East Turkestan or Southern Mongolia, but within mainland China as well. It's entirely because of that. Right. Well, there's the white paper protests that caused the end of zero COVID. Mm -hmm. Well, right. did they cause the end of zero COVID? Well, it was oh, a yeah. chicken and the egg thing there. Oh, but so, you know, we're talking about all, all these different people in China. And one of the things that you are also involved in besides being a member of parliament is the Free Indo-Pacific Alliance. Um, so can you tell us a bit about that and, and what this group does? It is one of the vision of the allies where we have uh, the activists from Tibet, East Turkestan, uh, uh, Southern Mongolia, Hong Kong, and Taiwan come together, uh, and also other nations facing the hegemony of China, coming together, uh, offering solidarity to each other, uh, and uh, going closer to our vision of uh, free nations. So this is uh, that was the reason why we all came together because uh, I think uh, Tibet as a movement we've been fighting alone. Is Turkestan, Uyghur, they've been doing that so far. South Mongolia, you know, everyone has been fighting our own fight against CCP. We realized that perhaps we'd be stronger, and uh, you know, we are actually you know after doing all these, we have realized that we are much more confident when we are together because uh, we've known that you know what is happening to us has been something that they have tested elsewhere, you know, and what is happening right now to them is something that we could experience as Tibetan community in the future as well. So there's so much learning from each other, you know, not about China, about what's happening inside the occupied territory, but more importantly, uh, letting each, us, each one of us in each other know that, you know, we are there for you, right? And because uh, for me personally, uh, when I went for the first ever round table with the Hong Kongers and Taiwanese activists, uh, that was in um, perhaps 2015 or so. So it was for, for me for the first time to see the Hong Kongers and Taiwanese activists in that number, right? Ten of each nation came together. And for me, this interaction with the Hong Kongers activists uh, to hear the opinions and what we saw in coming future after that in Hong Kong itself and for them to learn from us and to call us an inspiration for fighting ourselves and to let us know that, you know, uh, one thing, uh, yeah, one of the other meetings that I've had with some of the Hong Kongers is something that I'll never forget because some of them would come to us and say that, you know, why would Tibet, Tibetan government exile, want to say that they want to live under China? You know, look at us. Right. Uh, you know, uh, one of them even mentioned that, you know, we protest the decision that was made for us by, a, a, you know, predecessors by signing such a treaty which allowed us to be under Chinese rule. You know, and that was a shock for me, for me, uh, not just as independent activists, but as a Tibetan to think that I don't want to be part of such a wrong decision where the future generation of Tibetans will protest against my decision, will regret and will be in pain uh, under tyranny of Chinese government. You know, so these are all the lessons that we have learned from each other and the mistakes that we have made as uh, activists, you know, how they can learn from us. And now we are looking into um, 
different activists from different countries asking us about taking interest in Tibetan government in exile. You know, so that is quite uh, magnificent for me that, you know, is that something they are, um, they want to see for future of their nations. So, I mean, uh, yeah, this is how it's, it's, it's a space where we learn from each other as well. You know, not just about China. So, so paint us a picture of the future China that you would like to see. Uh, and when I say China here, I'm including the regions that you yeah. just mentioned. Yeah. Um, for me... Of course, I want to see the occupied nations as free, independent. So fully, and fully independent, not, not part of China at all. Nothing less than that. So for me, this is the only way for us to move on and try to forget, if not forgive. You know, this is how I see the future of China. And for China to be a democratic, strong nation that we can be friends and allies with. You know, this is how I see it. And this is how I would like the future of Tibet and future of Uzbekistan and Mongolia to move on with. Because if we don't see that, you know, the fact that we'll see such a distorted, uh, you know, a drenched Asia is impacting the world. And we don't realize how it's doing that. And uh, hence, it's so important that each one of us are free. Because uh, even if there's so much modernization, so-called development uh, under Chinese Communist Party or within China, the scar will remain. You know, uh, even after three, four generations in occupied Tibet, they haven't forgiven. They haven't forgotten the past history of Tibet. And the fact that they are living under such a wretched government, uh, such a tyranny and a dictatorial regime, they do not want to live under China. And hence, they are putting their lives on thread, burning themselves, coming out on the street. And to, you know, to bring an end to that, independence is the only way. And democracy within China is the only way as well. So essentially, you know, when, when Tibet becomes its own independent country, and one of the things that, that the Communist Party has said is, well, we've brought all this economic development to Tibet. We've increased the GDP. They have people who formerly were herders and they you know, come to the to Lhasa and they work in factories and they contribute to GDP. But, we, you know, in this future where Tibet is free and independent and administered by your government, like, what does Tibet look like? Do you have a plan for the economy? Like, you know, it's, it's a landlocked nation uh, that, you know, you have natural resources, industry, like, how do you, how do you make this a viable country that's not just living in abject poverty? Um, I don't think Tibet in the past, lived in poverty. This is how China wants to project Tibet as in the past. Uh, how I see Tibet is a nation on top of plateau, the highest roof of the world right now. And that actually means that it's filled with natural resources that China has been building its business empire on. Like you what? know, like what uh, natural Everything, resources? whether it's gold, copper, uh, Everything they need for the industry right now, whether it's the uh, mechanical industry uh, and the uh, each one of the stuff that we have, the phones, everything that we have, uh, each one of those material that we need from, they're all extracted from the land of Tibet. And I believe that once China is actually out of Tibet, those are ours. And I think we'll be more than capable of... Uh, uh, getting support from different countries in terms of human resources, uh, mines, uh, to help, you know, build this new uh, nation. I don't see a problem in that because in the past, the, the, I, I, couldn't, I wouldn't call that problem. Uh, Tibetans as a nation, being a Buddhist nation uh, and a nation which uh, revered uh, the uh, nature, we never harmed nature in terms of extracting natural resources. You know, we focus on that. But uh, right now, we know that we would find a means of find, finding a balance of um, developing a nation, yet not uh, causing harm to nature, you know. So I think, for me, I believe that Tibet is rich enough to be uh, resourceful. Tibet is rich enough for us to be shoulder to shoulder with other nations around the world. Because 60 years back, no nation was rich enough. Honestly speaking, each one of us had our own problem. Each one of us was living under our share of poverty, if I can put it that way, you know. So uh, what China, the reason why China uses the word poverty is to support its uh, excuse of uh, liberating us. Because who do you liberate? 
right? Something, somebody or individual or a group who is in a problem, in distress. So to kind of, uh, you know, like uh, uh, put a hand side or to support uh, their claim that they have actually uh, liberated us. They're saying we have been poor people living, you know. But then if you look at even the Tibetan nomads, the herders, uh, you know, one thing that we know, somebody as a grown up, who's grown up uh, in exile is they're economically very well. They are suf sufficient economically. So I don't think they need any sort of intervention from the Chinese Communist Party uh, to for them to be economically free. So it's just one of those uh, uh, image that we have that if you're a farmer, if you're a nomad, you're poor. No, that's not a fact. And that has been the case with Tibet. Uh, so I see it's better uh, for Tibet that we are independent. We'll be financially way better. And perhaps then China would want to shake hands with us because they will continue to need us once we're free.